and if you say yeah I've heard that already just hang in there and, and review so but we come this morning to our, our conclusion three lost things and this is from the 15th chapter of Luke and if you'll remember we talked about uh, we began with talking about the lost sheep and in the first one the lost sheep it was one out of a hundred it was one out of a hundred but it was worth it to the shepherd to leave the ninety and nine safely where they were and to look for the one that was lost one matters to God the world that we live in today uh, numbers count and God cares about numbers too because he wants everyone to be saved but God does not assign value based on numbers God cares about individuals God cares about you as I mentioned in the first service all along we all read uh, read on uh, online or we read in newspapers if we're still going back that far if we're reading hard copies of things we read stories of often elderly people that um, they were in an apartment somewhere maybe it was winter time or maybe summer time and they passed away and they were dead in their apartment for months we've all read stories about that haven't we or for a long time and nobody even noticed that they were missing nobody even noticed that they weren't around anymore and they're discovered so sadly for example perhaps when spring comes or summer comes and and the apartment they would smell something terrible and then they would break down the door and find that this person had passed away and we 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 and that's not something dramatic I, honestly we read about stories like that all the time and we think about that I was thinking about that in relation to the lost sheep um, and how sad that is that there are people that in this world's eyes and very often by their own actions they're estranged from family perhaps they have chosen to walk away from family and friends they're on their own but they are not cared for enough or loved for enough or noticed enough that somebody knows when they're gone and when they're not seen but the story that Jesus tells us and told them and tells us of the lost sheep one out of a hundred the shepherd noticed how did he notice I don't know maybe the sheep was distinctive he count or maybe he counted I mean we we dramatize it and say he counted and saw one was missing and that's what they would do we don't know and it's, just, it's a story that Jesus told but the point that we have the points that we have here was that the shepherd looked for the one that was lost it was just one it was just one but the one missing one matters to the shepherd and the one missing person matters to God you matter to God you count to God whether you are a good sheep or a black sheep you matter to God you count to God and he goes to the effort to find you to bring you back where you have wandered where you have strayed where you have been to use the terms of the of the sheep and the shepherding world where you have been drawn by grass that was greener a pasture over where you have been drawn by drawn by um, grass a little bit higher up the mountain away from the away away from the other uh, the other sheep he knows and he follows and he finds until he finds the one that's lost and so we talked about the lost sheep and then we talked about the lost coin and in the second service we ran out of time last week didn't we to talk about the lost coin I did it really really fast but so I wanted to take, take just a little bit of time this morning as we talk about the lost coin as we said um, it's part of the woman's dowry it would have been generally one of ten coins that would that uh, these days we wouldn't wear something around our our uh, our foreheads would we ladies we would wear it around our finger or something around our neck or something like that but this would have been worn around the forehead and one coin was missing and what did she do and for uh, what did she do she li she lit a lamp she swept the floor she searched carefully and as we talked about just briefly in the second service um, how much was that coin worth it had external value because it was a coin so on the face value of it according to the language that's used in the Bible it was a drachma d-r-a-c-h-m-a -M -A, a drachma which in those ter 
terms would have been one day's salary for a soldier or for a day laborer, you know, when someone is hired just to work for the day. Um, in a rich family, it wouldn't have been considered very much at all. In a poorer family, it would have, on face value, it would have been worth a great deal. But we see from the effort that the woman expends that it meant more to her than just a day's wage, didn't it? Because it represented the love of the husband for the wife. It was a wedding, it was like a, a wedding gift, if you will. And we read that she lit the lamp, she swept the floor, and she searched carefully until she found it. How much was it worth to her? How much was it worth to her? Think about that for just a minute. And I want to do in the second service what we did in the first service last week. There's some coins up here. Uh, and I saw in the, during, during worship, Kingsley really, he saw the coins. Kingsley really wanted to come up and pick up those coins, didn't he? And, and, and Flora kept him. He was sitting there. He really wanted to come up and get some coins. Thank you, Mother, for keeping him from, from getting my, uh, my uh, illustration, my, my lesson, my object lesson here. But there's some coins scattered around here. And over here, now I've already, I already know what Robert will do because he was in the first service last week and some of you were as well. Over here, there's a, wow, there's a $10 coin, okay? How many of you would lean on the street? How many of you would lean over and pick up a $10 coin? <laughs> Pastor Renee? All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, so would I. So let me lean over and pick it up, okay? How many of you would not lean over and pick up a $10 coin? Okay, Elaine. So I, I think I know the answer, but why not, Elaine? Uh, and I told the last, she said, it's not mine. That's the same thing someone else said. And I said, please don't think less of your pastor. I'd pick it up. <laughs> it's, in the last service, uh, some people said, it's not mine. Another person said, because of germs, it's really dirty. And then someone said, maybe there's a camera. <laughs> which I had never thought of, okay? But maybe in Hong Kong there are cameras, I don't know. So there's a $10, I'd pick up a $10. We've got some other, uh, over here, here's another coin. Not quite as big as the $10, it's a $1 coin. How many of you would bend over in the street and pick up a $1 coin? Okay, how many of you would not? Really? Is your salary greater than my salary, Pastor Renee? Cause <laughs> Because I'm, I'm telling you, I'd pick up that $1. Okay. There's a $1 coin. Most of us, most of us would. Oh, I'm sorry. A That's a five. five. Pastor Renee, there you go. Okay. Most of us would, any others of you would not pick up a five? We know Elaine won't because it's not hers. Anybody else? You wouldn't pick up a, Julie, why not? It's not mine. Dirty. Okay, Stanley, you would pick up. It, it's a good thing that there's one fiscally responsible person in your family. Oh, okay, Stanley's telling stories about his wife now. She would say, pick it up. Okay, so there's a, there's a $5 coin. Let's look around a little bit more. Three more coins. Here's another one over here. Smaller still. It's a 50 cent piece. How many of you would pick up a 50 cent coin? You'd lean over, okay? Okay, some of us still would, uh, and, but, the, but the hands are growing fewer hands than there were, okay? But there's still two more coins here. There's a 20 cent coin over here. Would any of you lean over and pick up a 20 cent coin? Yes. Ah, okay. Why? Because it's money. <laughs> it's money, okay. There's one final coin over here. You know, I was here in Hong Kong, and those of you who are really old Hong Kongers, you remember back before, remember when there were really small coins? Even the, what were they? They were one, like one cent and two cents, right? Way, way back when. Andrea says, I'm too young to remember that. I remember that. They were notes. Paper. Ah, okay. And then? Ah, oh, over here. Here's 10 cents. I just reached over and picked it up. Would any of you pick up a 10 cent coin? Yes. Because it's, it's 
It's worth something, okay? And some of you, some of you say, no, I, no, I wouldn't do that. So my question is this, all of them have value, but apparently some of these coins have greater value to some people than they do to others, right? Because in this group, some of you says, yeah, say, yes, I would pick it up, and some of you say, no, I wouldn't. So when we look at these coins, and then we think about the coin that the woman lost and she searched for, what's the value? How do we determine value? In, these, in this case, these coins have a face value, and yet, obviously, for some of you, the face value was not enough to go to the effort or for other reasons to lean over and to pick it up. You would have left it. You'd pick up a 10 or a 5 but maybe not a 50 cents or maybe not a 20 cents or a 10 cents. And so to me when I look at that and I think about the drachma and other because the commentators some of them say it was worth this much, some say it was worth this much and some say it was worth this much. To me the value of the coin is found in what the woman was willing to do to find the coin. The effort she was willing to expend, the trouble to which she was willing to go, the time that she was willing to use to find that coin. And it was valuable to her beyond the face value. And because it was valuable, she was willing to light a lamp. She was willing to sweep the floor. She was willing to search carefully until she found it because it had value to her. Brothers and sisters, this describes the love of God your Father for you. This describes, this lets you know in a very tangible, of, in, a, in, a, in a picture form that we can understand your value to God your Father, how He values you. In this world, some of you, according to whatever, maybe according to your productivity, maybe according to your education or your sex, male or female or, or, educate, or whatever, some of you are, ten, are ten dollar coins in this world. Some of you are ten cent coins according to the world's eyes, right? And sometimes according to our own eyes as well, right? Sometimes we look at our own selves in these ways. The point of this story is, one of the points of this story, there's, there's another, there's a main point that we're looking at. God does more than say, oh, this one is $10, it's worth more. This one is 10 cents. It's not worth expending effort on. God looks at us the same way. God loves us the same way. If the world says, you're a $10 coin, God says, I'll look for you if you're lost. If the world says, you're a 10 cent coin, God says, I will look for you if you are lost. This is the love of God the Father for you and for me. This is the love of God the Father. For me, I was thinking of another application as well yesterday, um, and I don't think this was what Jesus intended, but the Holy Spirit can make things fresh and new to us at different times as we come to His Word. And for me, I began to understand it, or the application for me was another one yesterday, because the woman went into the darkness, the house was dark, and she lit a lamp to find the coin. It was, it was a dark house, probably only one door, maybe there was some light from the door, or maybe no window, so it would have been exceptionally dark. So she went into a dark, she looked in a dark place. Secondly, she swept carefully, and then she l searched carefully. And the picture for me as I think about that is this. You see if she was lighting a lamp and searching carefully, the oil lamps were not particularly strong. And when you lit a lamp, it didn't cast a lot of light. She, if she held it up this way and looked around, she probably would not, find the co would not have found the coin on the floor. But for that lamp to make any difference, you have to get close to the ground. You have to get close to the dirt. Maybe you have to get on your hands and knees down in the dirt and on the rocks to find the coin that's lost. And for me, 
the Holy Spirit made an application to my life yesterday. And for me, I saw a picture of Jesus. I really did. I saw a picture of Jesus who left heaven, wonderful heaven. We haven't seen heaven yet. Beautiful heaven. We've heard about it. We sang about it this morning and our hearts get excited when we think about heaven. But oh, we understand so little, don't we? And Jesus left heaven and the glory of heaven and the beauty of heaven and the light of heaven and his position in heaven. And he came down into our darkness. And he came down into our dirt. And he came down, if you will, and got on his hands and knees. And you say, oh, don't talk about Jesus that way. That's how I see it. On his hands and knees to search in the dirt and in the dark in all the effort that was needed to find you and to find me. Why? Because it was the only way to find us. Why? Because it's the only way to reach us. Why? Because that's what it will take for you and for me to be found in our darkness and in our dirt. And so that's what he did. And that shows how much he loves us. And that shows our value to him. Your value to him. Not what others say about you. Not what the world says about you. But the one who made you says of you, you are valuable to me. And I will go to great effort. And I will go to great expense and I will go to, I will give up a lot of things. I will give up everything to find you and to bring you back. And that coin is found and it is put back in its rightful place. It's put back in the place it was intended to be. And that's what God does when he finds us. He brings us back and he puts us in the right place, in the right place. Sometimes we kind of wonder, where do I fit? Have you ever wondered that? Where do I belong? Where do I fit? What's my role? Of, I, I'm just a this, fill in the blank. But God has a place for us. And God has a work for us. And brothers and sisters, when you work with God, when you work with God, and when you let God bring you and put you in the place that he has made for you, then you will be productive, you will be content, you will be filled with joy and you will do the work of the Father and be the person that God has planned for you to, do, to be and to do, wherever that is and whatever it is. Because God has a good place for every one of us. God has the right place for every one of us. And it's the place that he has planned for you and for me. And that's what that woman does with the coin. She puts it back where it belongs. And then she rejoices. And then she celebrates. And so we talked about the sheep and the coin. And then Jesus follows up. I'm going to skip some, sorry, I'm going to skip some slides. I want to keep on going. Um, although, yeah, I'm going to skip some, I'm going to skip some slides. And then we come to the last story. And that's the story of the lost son. So there was a lost sheep, one out of a hundred. There was a lost coin, one out of ten. And there was a lost son, one out of two. One out of two. And as I sit back and look at Robert and Hazel this morning and they're getting ready to go off to Germany, I, I think of Stephanie and Alexander. You've got two. What if one wanders off? You've still got one of them. No parent would say that's okay, right? No parent would ever say that. And we see this picture in this story. Three lost things. So let's look at the son. Jesus has told the first two stories. They're really all part of the one story. And he wants them to understand the love of the Father. And he wants them, I think, part of it is to understand the value that each one of them has in the Father's eyes. And here's what we see. This is, this is the last parable that he tells in Luke 15, 11 through 13. So let's look at this further. This one is a little bit different from the first two. In the first one, the sheep wandered off through carelessness, as sheep will, or the grass is greener a little bit further up the mountain. And the sheep wanders off um, 
on its own, nothing deliberate. I think, I don't know if sheep can do anything very deliberate or not. <laughs> I'm not sure, um, not, not going into the mind of a sheep, but it's not a deliberate, it just wanders. And as I think about that, I, I think about people like us and, and others. Sometimes people don't deliberately wander away, do they? They just wander, right? How many of you would say in your own heart and in your own life, there have been times when you have wandered from the closeness of fellowship with the Lord, not through deliberate choice, but just kind of carelessness or just you weren't paying attention and you wandered off. And then you got to a certain place and you kind of think, how did I get here? I'm far from where I want to be, and yet my heart is cold. I'm far from fellowship with the Lord. I'm out of fellowship with other Christians. Would you say that that describes your life at times? A few of you quietly said yes, that has described my life at times. It has, because we're all human. We're all people. And so we see that in the lost sheep. In the lost coin, it's lost apparently through just carelessness perhaps, and sometimes Things are lost and people are lost through carelessness. Then we come to the last story, which is different from the first two, because in this story, the son is lost through a deliberate choice, through deliberate choice. And if we were honest, every one of us would say, I confess and I admit, there are times I have deliberately chosen. I can say that about myself. I don't know about you. There are times I've deliberately chosen I reject the love of the Father, I reject the Father's care, I reject the Father's guidelines, I reject the Father's house, I'm going to do my thing, I'm going to go my way, and I don't want the Father to tell me what to do with my life. Has that, has that ever described your life? It describes my life. In the past, there have been times, and that's the picture that we have. So the, sto the story of the, the lost son is a little bit different. And so he tells the story, and we see this in Luke 15, 11 through 13. The man had two sons. He may have had some daughters. Please don't get upset and say, Jesus is telling a sexist story. What about the daughters? Okay, the daughters would not have received an inheritance and gone off somewhere. That wasn't done in that culture and that society. So he uses an example that they could understand. By the way, when the, son, when the younger son says to the father, I want my share of estate now before you die, do you know what he really meant by saying that? What he meant was, in effect, I wish you were dead. It, that's what it meant. Because if you were dead, I could get what I wanted. Now, because he was a younger son, he would get one-third of the, st the estate. That was the, that was the Jewish in law of inheritance. Uh, the, older, the older son, the firstborn son, would get two-thirds. He'd get a double portion, and then the younger son would get, um, would get a, a, a single portion. Now, fathers would sometimes divide their inheritance with their children. Uh, I don't know how many of you have received, although your parents or relatives are still alive, have you received any inheritance yet? I've received a little bit. My mother gave me a piece of jewelry. Um, she said, I want you to, she said, she said I'm old and wrinkled. <laughs> and she said, I want you to enjoy it now. So she gave me a piece of jewelry. She gave my sister a piece of jewelry. It's a beautiful jade. Uh, my sister received a ring and I received a pendant from Singapore from years and years ago. Really, really beautiful. Um, but to tell you the truth, it's so beautiful and so valuable, I don't wear it very often. <laughs> I just keep it in my, in my jewelry box, <laughs> which is not the intent. M Mom wanted us to wear it. Um, and I received a picture from her, uh, a small glass picture, pitcher, not picture, pitcher that you pour things, um, that came from her relatives, her Amish, German Amish relatives from way back when. It's more than a hundred years old. Uh, it's, it's small. I, I don't know if it has any value to be sold, I, but I would never sell it because it's valuable to me. It's from, my, it's, it's from my ancestors. And so I've received a little bit of inheritance. But what would happen in the Jewish, Jewish culture is this. If the father divided the inheritance and gave it, what would happen is this. The child could use the inheritance, he could manage the land or manage the sheep, but the, the principal, but the prophet, the prophet would go to the father. As long as the father was alive, all the profit, all the income would go to the father still. So this tells us how terrible his actions are because what the son does is this. 
he packed his belongings and moved to a distant land. You say, but it doesn't say that he sold it. He had to have sold it because in those days, value was in cattle, sheep, or land. It, ha it was in those two things. So for him to take all his belongings and move to a distant land and have money to spend, he had to sell it. That was a slap in the face to the father, a, a terrible slap in the face. It showed, I don't care about you, I don't love you, and it also showed, I don't care what happens to you, because the income was to provide for the father in his old age. So that tells you something about the awfulness of what the son does. And I want us to understand that, because it helps us to understand the great love of the father a little bit later when we come to the end of the story. So he goes off. Now there's much more to this story than we have time to look at this morning. Um, so we're going to go through it quickly. Maybe another time we'll come back to this story, but let's look at a few things here. He goes off to a distant land. He goes off to, as we said in the first service, he goes off to Macau. <laughs> okay? Because this is a parable that we should be able to understand. He goes off to Macau, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. I'd say Macau is probably a good place where you can live wildly, right? for some wild living and maybe some other places too. I, I know people that can live very wildly in Hong Kong as well. You can, by the way, you can live wildly almost anywhere. You really can. And so he wasted all his money in wild living. Look at this word for just a minute. Do you know what the word wasted means? The word wasted in the Greek means to scatter. It means to scatter. And this word is also used in the New Testament by a farmer. And you know what it means? You know when that word is used? It's after the farmer has gathered the grain, and then the oxen tread out the grain, and then he picks it up in a basket, and he throws it in the air so that the chaff and the husks are blown away by the wind, and he saves the precious grain. That's the word, when it's thrown in the air, when it's scattered. That's the word that's used here. And I think about that. We're looking at this story, but I think about us as well. And we look at this prodigal son, as we call him, prodigal means wasted, um, at this prodigal son who scatters his money in wild living. Oh, if it were in Macau, he would go to the, what did we say? He would go to the Lisboa or the Bellagio or, or, or whatever. Um, what else would he do? He'd drink, wouldn't he, Keith? Thank you. Keith says this. We all, we all know what that means. What else would he do to, to scatter to scatter his income? He would party. He would party. What else? Let's be specific. Because Jesus, Jesus doesn't tell us wild, li wild living. Um, what else would he do? Oh, he'd take many women. When you've got a lot of money, you can, it's easy to have friends and companions, isn't it? What else might he do? Gamble, casinos, you name it. He could do it. But I want us to think for just a minute because we look at that and we think, oh, so bad. But I believe there are other ways to waste money. I, and let me change that. I believe there are other ways to waste our resources, to waste what is valuable, to waste what is precious, to scatter it. And I would say all of us don't think about somebody else for just a minute. Think about your own life. And think about the times when you have taken the time that you have that is precious and you've just scattered it. You've taken the energy that you've had and you've just scattered it on things that are of little value or of no value. Things that will not bring a return. And it's just, and once you've scattered it, it's gone. And you think to yourself, where did it go? What happened to it? But that's what happens when we waste things. You can't point and you say, well, here it is. Well, here's what I got from it. It's just gone. It's just gone. I think about our hearts as well. How many of us have taken our hearts and the emotions and the love of our hearts and scattered it on people that broke our hearts and used us up and there was nothing left to show for it and when there was no more love or when things came to an end they left us and said see you later and they went on to find another person and another heart and another place and we wasted it and we had nothing to show for it
That is what it means to be a prodigal. And if we look at it in that way, you have been a prodigal and I've been a prodigal. We have all wasted. We've all wasted. Thank God. Thank God that for every prodigal, there is a father whose love is greater than all the wasting that we can do. There is a father who's greater. In this world's economy, and in this world's eyes, when a life is wasted, when love is wasted, when time and energy are wasted, that's it. There's not much else in this world's sight, in this world's economy. But that is not how God looks at it. That is not how God sees it. And the prodigal goes off and he wastes all his money in wild living. And then I want us to look at what comes next. Because you know what? God is not the only one who has perfect timing. You know that? God's not the only one with perfect, perfect timing. Do you know who else has perfect timing in your life? Perfect timing. Do you know who it is? The devil. Satan. He has perfect timing too. He really does. He really does. And look at this. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land. Surprise! About the time the money runs, runs out. That's how the devil does it. You think you've got enough, and then it begins to run out, and that's when the famine comes. The devil's timing is perfect in your life. And so you need to be careful about that, and you need to be aware of that, and we need to, be, we need to have our eyes open as we live and as we work in this world. And he begins to starve. He begins to starve, and so what does he do? He's separated from family. He's separated from friends. He's separated from his resources and everything he could do to help himself. So what does he do? I'll take care of pigs. Now, I don't want to take care of pigs, do you? It's not necessarily the best thing to do. How many of you have taken care of pigs before? Some of you? That's right. That's right. But it's, it's smelly work, isn't it? It's smelly work. My uncle, my dad's brother, used to take, uh, used to have, he was a, a, a farmer, had quite a large farm. So he farmed, he had crops, and he also had cows, and he also had pigs. And I always loved to go to Uncle Wayne's. And this is where I told, I've told you stories before about harvesting watermelon and harvesting tomatoes. It was on his farm. But we would always, as we drove up, we lived about an hour away in Alabama. They lived in Florida. As we drove up into his yard, I could always smell the pigs. And you know what? If you've been around livestock, because he had cows also, there's a difference in smell, isn't there? <laughs> Pastor Renee says, yes. There's, there's no mistaking the smell of a pig, is there? And so this son attaches himself. He says, let me work for you. I think this must have been a very unfair employer because he's still hungry and he's hoping to eat what the pigs are eating. For the young man who probably in the story of Jesus, this would have been a Jewish man, this, a, a Jewish young man, this would have been the worst of the worst. This would be as low as you could go. And to me, I think the point of this story is this. The young man could not sink any lower. This was the lowest he could go. And that's where he is. And that's where we are sometimes as well. But no one gave him anything. No one gave him anything. And the enemy will separate you and he will keep you away. He will get you away from God. And what at one time was pleasing to you will become a prison to you. At one time it was pleasure, it will become a prison. Because that's how the devil does it. That's how the devil does it. And you say, oh, Pastor Jennifer, you don't know what you're talking about. You're a goody two-shoes. I know my life. And you know your life. I know what I'm talking about. And without God in our lives, pleasure can become a prison and a trap. And he hasn't, he's the lowest he can get. He's the lowest he can get. But that's not the end of the story. When God is left out of our lives, enjoyment can become enslavement. But that's not the end. And we see in Luke, in the next passage, he came to his senses and he said to himself, now, look with me for just a minute as we come. We've, got a, we've, we've still got some time left this morning. And I want you to look 
at what he starts to say and what he starts to see. Because I believe the enemy deceives us when he, when he pulls us away from the Lord. I really do. Because you see, I think if we understand, if we understand and really see, God, this is your love. God, this is your life. God, this is what it's like to be in fel fellowship with you and at home with you. When we understand that fully, generally, I, I think we are not going to leave. I think it takes a very depraved heart to say, God, I know your love. I fully understand it. I don't want you. I think most people who reject the Lord, who choose to walk away, have, fa have fallen into deception. I, I really do believe that. And they've chosen, they choose another way, thinking this is a better way. I get freedom. Why did the son leave home? He wanted to be free. <sighs> is this freedom? There's no freedom there. He wanted to choose his own way. He wanted to live his own life. But he comes to himself. And when he comes to himself, look at what happens. He sees things differently. And when we come to ourselves, we see things differently. And I love verse 20. So he returned home to his father. That's the son side of the story. But really, Jesus tells this story not for the son's side. Do you know who Jesus tells this story for? For the father's side, really. Now, this, this part is really interesting to us, isn't it? We can imagine the wild living. We can imagine the smell and the stink of the pigs and all of that. But really, the focus of this story is not the sin of the son, but it's the love of the father. It's the love of the Father. And so he returns home, and what do we see next? While he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. I want to ask you something then, this morning. This was a rich home, right? The father had a lot. Did he have servants? Yes, he had servants. Was there another son? Yes, there was. Does the other son see his brother walking down the road a long way off? No. What about all the servants in the home? No. All of the servants in the home did not see the sun a long way off. Who is the one who sees the sun a long way off? Who is it? Why is it the father? Why isn't it the other son? Why isn't it some of the servants or the slaves that the father may have? Why is it the father who sees the son? He's looking for him. He recognizes him. What did you say, Noma? He's waiting for him. He's waiting for him. And I love this part of the story. A long way off, he sees him. That means that the father didn't give up. The, so the song that, uh, that, we were, that I was listening to this morning, and I was so moved again as we were looking at the, the, uh, the second clip, the second video from Sichuan as well, and the, the song that was about love. And that one line really struck my heart this morning, and it was about love doesn't give up on you. Something like love doesn't give up on you even when you give up on yourself. Love doesn't give up. And that t really touched my heart. And I, I was Because I knew I was going to be preaching this this morning. And it really touched my heart as I was thinking about this. I'll bet you the older son had given up. Don't you think? I think the older son had given up. In fact, not only had the older son given up, I am guessing, and I know this is a, a short parable, but if I were in that situation, honestly, to tell you the truth, you know what I would say as an older son? And so would you. Good riddance. He didn't work anyhow. He was a lazy bum, right? I'm the one that, and we see that by his bad attitude a little bit later in the story. I'm the one that did all the work anyhow. He was nothing but trouble. He always caused problems. Me, I'm the faithful one. The elder son certainly wasn't looking for him. The servants weren't looking for him. Who was looking for him? The one who loved him. The one who loved him. And here we have this beautiful picture. He runs to him, and it says, oh, filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son. Now, you and I might say filled with love, compassion, anger, and resentment because the son had wasted everything that he had given him and now was stinky and smelling, and who was he to come back home and think he could come back home and come back into the family again? Well, I'll tell him. Is that in there anywhere? No, I made that up, because that's not in there. 
That's not in there. It says he embraced him and he kissed him. And do you know what this word means in the original? It means he kissed him and kissed him and kissed him. Now, men, you say, I don't like that. I don't do that. <laughs> That's because you are not a Middle Eastern man. That would be true in a Middle Eastern culture. And what it shows is love and care, filled with love and compassion. Let me ask you something. Was the young son still dirty? Yes. Was the young son still smelly? really smelly really really smelly does the father wait for the son to get clean before he expresses love no. does the father wait for the son to prove himself before he demonstrates his acceptance no, no. the son starts to the son repents but let's look at what happens next we go into the next passage. And his father said to the servants, I love this word. What is this word? Right there. Quick, or in New Living, hurry. I love this word. And look with me. Why is this word such a wonderful word? Because the father does not reserve or hold back love. The father doesn't say, well, you've been away. Let's see if you're really worthy of being my son again. Let's see. Let's let you prove yourself. You can work in the field for one month. And if you work in the field without complaining from morning to night, and you're willing to eat whatever I give you, then maybe I'll embrace you. Maybe I'll hug you. Maybe, maybe I'll bring you back in. To the family but the son the father says get a bring the finest robe in the house who had the finest robe in the house who the father the father and bringing the giving him the robe meant acceptance in the family and then he says get a ring for his finger what did the ring symbolize the ring symbolized you are a son you are a son again he says get a ring for his finger and then he says Sandals for his feet. What do the sandals mean? Well, first of all, it means that that young son walked back barefoot from the far country. Wow, pretty tough, right? That was hard to do. But he says sandals for his feet. Why were the sandals important? The sandals said to the son and the sandals said to everyone, you are not a servant because servants and slaves did not generally did not wear sandals that was the custom they would ge they would generally be bare barefoot but he said get sandals for him and the sandals told everyone in the community that the father loved the son and accepted him the sandals and the ring and the robe told the son i love you i accept you i receive you back I do not put you on probation. I am not angry with you. I am not going to because you have wasted what I gave you, what really was mine, and you wasted it. I accept you and I love you. Oh, beloved brothers and sisters, what a picture of the heart of the Father for you this morning, for me this morning, and for everyone else that we look at sometimes. When you stray from the Father, when you are lost, when you go your own way, when you and I choose deliberately to go our own way, and then we come to our senses, and we turn around, and we come back, the Father is not saying, well, Julie, Prove yourself. Let's see if you're really a good Christian again. But don't we think that sometimes? Don't we feel that sometimes? We feel like God's still, God's angry with me. Have you ever felt that? God's angry with me. I blew it. I wasted. I have been prodigal. God's angry with me. I have to prove myself. Now sin is serious. And Jesus is not saying, oh, it doesn't matter. It matters because of what it cost and what is lost. But the love of God is greater. And this story that Jesus told, the penultimate story that he tells them, he wants them to understand. The Father is not angry with you. The Father loves the one who comes back to him. There's no probationary period.
There's no, well, let's wait and see. The Father, when we come back, He embraces. He more than does His part to bring us back to Himself and to love us and to include us and to say, you're my child and you are part of the family. That is how God is towards us. That is how God desires us to be towards others. This is the grace of God. This is the love of God. It is a lie of the enemy for you to think God's angry with you. God's only going to give you a little bit of love until you prove yourself. He loves you. And when you come back to him, he more than does his part to run to you. Are you cleaned up yet? No. You still stink just a little bit. And so do I. But he runs and he embraces, and he kisses, and he kisses, and he loves. And this is the love of the Father. And I love this phrase that ends this part of the story before the grumpy elder brother, which is for another time. And so the party began. Don't you love that? The party began. Don't let the enemy keep you away from the love of the Father from the fellowship of the family, from the comfort of the home of God, because it is where you belong in relationship with the Father. A lost sheep the shepherd went looking for, because even one matters. A lost coin the woman diligently searched with all effort. Why? Because she wanted to bring it back into place. In a lost son, the father waited and embraced and accepted without stinting, without reservation, because of his love. Love is greater than sin. Love is greater than rebellion. Love is greater than deliberate choices away from him. And when we turn... And when we come back home, we find love is greater. Let's close in prayer this morning.